and welcome back to History Up Close from the National Naval Aviation Museum. It's our honor to bring this program to you twice a week. My name is Dwayne Thiessen. I'm the President and CEO of the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. And today we have a special presentation for you. You know, when you think of the uh, Naval Aviation Museum, you think of aircraft. And we have 150 of some of the finest exhibit aircraft exhibits that you can find anywhere in the world. But we also have a lot of other artifacts and exhibits that are very unique and you can't find anywhere else. Today, we have the honor of having Dr. Buddy Macon take you through our home front display or exhibit here in the museum. You know, Buddy's been here for 30 years and more than anyone else in the organization here he is the right person to take you through this experience. So please stay with us and enjoy today's presentation of The Home Front by Buddy Macon. Well, thank you, General, for that kind introduction. Yes, I've been here 30 years. <laughs> and so it's very um, strange for me to come out of my lair, but I really wanted to share with you today something that we did. You know, when you work at a national institution like this, exhibits generally are built to last three to five years. In this case, it's been here 25 years. And the reason it's been here so much is that it still has a pop and people still enjoy every aspect of it. Now, let me tell you something. We're gonna have a little small snippets of this as we talk, but the only way to get the full flavor of this exhibit is to come visit it yourself. And I would ask each and every one of you when the COVID-19 is over with, that you come back and enjoy us. And so let's get started. We enter this exhibit through our version of the Sanger Theater. And from here, we just simply want to take you back in time a little bit to the way life was almost 80 years ago. We depict this in July, sort of 1943. So what was going on during that time is that uh, we represent here for the American service member receiving a ticket. At that point in time, for 35 cents, you could get a cartoon, a serial with an S, not a C, and a two and a half hour full length movie brought to you in living color. And speaking of that, 1942, 1943, some top movies were available. One of the most popular movies was dealing with a little white tailed deer, her parents, and a little bunny rabbit known as Thumper. Got any idea? Let us know. The second highest movie ranking that year was one of my all time favorites. And if you get a chance, ladies and gentlemen, go download this movie. It starred James Cagney and he was portraying the life of George M. Cohan. As a, as a result of that, the beautiful movie, Yankee Doodle Dandy. During a movie theater, it was more than just entertainment. That's where a lot of people found out information about the war through newsreels. They were shown daily in every matinee and every service. So if you will, let's go back and, and just visit an old friend. And we'll walk this way we enter the lobby before we go into the hometown. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things that were going on in, with our country in that day. Two of the biggest primary things that well, any community was involved with was the scrap drives as well as rationing. Scrap drives and rationing. Scrap drives were important not only to recycle things, but rationing was important to make people make sure that do with less so that our American service people, men and women, would have more. Not unlike COVID-19, what we're suffering through today. How many of you out there have gone into the grocery store and discovered no bread, no rice, no whatever, especially toilet paper, which I haven't figured that one out yet. But the United States federal government recognized right after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December 7th, 1941, that they immediately had to support the giant war effort. As a result of that, certain things, over 300 items were rationed. Rations were very simple. Each family would have been given a book, which we have located here, would have been given a book. And without going into great detail, there was basic red and blue stamps. They would be given stamps accordingly so that they could go and purchase items. Along with the monies that were necessary, you had to have the appropriate amount of stamps. And I don't want to bore you with everything going in there, but as we go into the grocery store, we're going to see it in application. 
The scrap drives were huge because not only were things rationed, they had to do without. So things such as gasoline was rationed. A family generally could have up to four gallons a week, and that is all. Certain factory workers, medical staff, and et cetera, were allowed to have up to eight gallons a week. So put that in your mind as we continue walking on that people gave constantly, all right? Walk this way. Now, let me show you, let me show you something. One of the greatest artifacts we have in this museum is on loan from a Pensacolian, John Winsky. As a result of that, Mr. Winsky has redid this entire 1942 called a victory model. And the reason why it is such a beautiful example is that it did not contain all the parts that were necessary because of the war effort. So things had to be substituted, glass, etc. They continue to make this. We have a, a, a wonderful poster depicting the music of democracy. Wurlitzer organization, like every other giant company, changed production to support the war effort. They quit making jukeboxes and they started making armaments and ammunition and tank holdings. So just keep that in the back of your mind that the world is changing. If you take a moment to set this standard, I want you to just listen, close your eyes, and go back and just envelop this time by listening to one of the greatest songs ever recorded. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Miller, Moonlight Serenade. Join me now as we go back into what we refer to as Hometown USA. What you're seeing right now is a recreation of rural America. Now, we took it from various places. There's a little bit of Pensacola. There's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and we'll talk about it as we go. But I want to draw your attention into what was we talked about earlier was the scrap drives. Here's an example, pots and pans for democracy women's silks that they wore. Silks would be turned into parachutes. Cans such as this, which are produced out of tin. The reason I had earlier that rubber was the first item to ever be conserved and rationed was because we no longer had that ability. Tin was also controlled. As a result of that, people used these up, flattened them out, and put them on the side of the road. Rationing was one thing. Scrap drives allowed the communities themselves to be involved so that the mothers, fathers, grandmothers, aunts, and uncles who had service members in the military would have a way of saying they also want to help. Come on in, Donald. I'm going to bring you into the house. And what we're seeing now is a house that is reminiscent from that time period, usually built around 1929. This is the interior of a house from the former director. In, in California. I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of things because as we go and, and learn about this, the family unit, this is where they congregated, was in the parlor or living area. In the 1920s, World War I and post in 1930s, a piano was generally the central attraction for family unity. Well, as World War II came around, more and more radios were available. Fireside chats were brought to you by President Roosevelt. An example of which, hopefully, we, with a little modern technology, we can let you hear. Goes down, the Axis powers will control the continents of Europe and Asia and Africa and Australasia and the high seas. And they will be in a position to bring along... During that point in time frame, you've heard about certain type of uh, uh, radio program, be they radio broadcast, etc. But the unit of the radio provided information that was really important so they could learn not only about their loved ones and what was going on in our country, but also what was going on in the world. Now, one of the things I want you to pan around, Donald, and look up here towards the window in the dark. These were known as blackout curtains, most notably on coastals. As a result of that, they were a requirement to be lowered, that electricity not only for lighting for not only U-boats, or for the, the proposed enemy might find them, they cut out all lights. Headlamps on automobiles were half done with tape to prevent light. 
So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna let Donald walk around here and I'm gonna join you into the very heart of the house, which is the kitchen. Welcome to that wonderful place that homemakers alike brought to life. This is one of the finest recreations of the 1940s or possibly could be. Now, true enough, you look at it, it's got a little bit more than what your normal homemaker would have. But we wanted to share with you a few things. First of all, let me show you something. This is known as a Hoosier cabinet, all right? This is the fancy model with the flour dispensers that fresh biscuit could be made. Now, in modern day houses, Remember cabinet space and everything you have to work with. Well, this was it. This is where things were produced, made, manufactured. As a result of that, these type homemakers provided almost everything. Now, we talked about earlier. Remember we talked about rationing? We talked about scrap? Well, this is an actual, Donald can zoom, a victory cookbook. And what it did, it allowed people to take with less and make with more for their family. One of the highlights of this kitchen, I'm going to tell you right up front, is this. This is called a globe top Kelvinator General, General Electric, excuse me, a globe top General Electric. The reason why this uh, uh, Darth Vader looking top is on here is that this is where the condenser was. Now, interesting enough, this is an ultra rare item. And the reason is, is because we believe it may be one of the longest running refrigerators. It still works. And the reason we know it works is because when we were building this wonderful exhibit and after the day was done, it's where we kept the beer. So right up front, let me show you something. Part of the war effort dealt with canning. Part of the war effort dealt with canning because people wanted to have their own victory gardens, grow their own vegetables, and the government wanted them to have take care of themselves. So as a result of that, canning became very popular. Uh, one thing about canning is, is very interesting is always look at the number on the bottom. All right. The reason being is post World War II and pre NASCAR, uh, let's just say some people were uh, driving illegal type of alcohol products in the Tennessee and Georgia mountains. Number 13 was always unlucky, so they smashed them. If you find one in an antique store, get it today. One of the things I want to show you about is uh, speaking of rationing and shorts and also the drives, is this is just bacon grease. Now, the most amazing thing about bacon grease is that from a southern homemaker to give up her baking grease to support the war effort was tremendous because they took excess vegetable oils, cooking oils, etc., and made glycerin. Glycerin, of course, was used for bombs. Hey, just a second, I'm gonna go back out on the street. If Donald could meet us back on the street, meet you at the drugstore. Drug stores played an important part of role because from here where pharmacists were allowed to dole out uh, not only medicine, but they, they provided a much larger envelope. They were part, heart and soul of any type small town. One of the things I'd like Donald to pan in on is go up and I want you to take a look at the left part of this exhibit, all the photographs. Now the interesting thing about those photographs, it was not unlike for businesses throughout um, America to put their employees who were serving in the war, their family members who were serving the war. The most interesting thing about this is every person you see from World War II was a volunteer at the National Naval Aviation Museum. Every one of them. We wanted to pay homage to them and this is their way to be forever not forgotten. One of the things that Donald can pan to now is a barbershop. Barbershops were very interesting because unlike today with COVID-19, they're all closed, this too provided a central area for information exchange and gossip. People always ask us how we do and build these things and that's for a later story. Now usually right here, we are playing the 1943 baseball all-star game. And the reason baseball was so important because President Roosevelt himself ask that baseball continue for the war effort. All right? All right, now let's look at this. This is a fascinating exhibit. This is one, it's a pawn shop. Not unlike today, pawn shops served a great need during those war years. Reason being, a lot of people still didn't trust banks because the Great Depression had already ended. This was a way that people could get short change for an item for a loan. After X amount of time, they paid the credit, the interest, they received the item back. Now, the most interesting thing here, this is an original pawn shop neon sign, L&L Pawn Shop, 
that was in Pensacola, Florida. The proprietor was named Abe Levitt. Those of you that may find it interesting, look up and see who his children were. All right? All right. One of the favorite exhibits in the museum deals with Jake's Garage. Not unlike most repair shops and mechanics during those time years, they took care of mostly everything. What you're seeing in front of you right now is a World War II Harley Davidson military motorcycle. This motorcycle that's in our collection actually served in General Patton's Third Army. You'll notice Donald's panning over the tires. Remember we talked about retreading tires. They put everything, when tires wore out, they couldn't get them new. So they used everything, be they cotton, canvas, old shoes, etc., went on tires to try to keep them going as long as we could. Now, one of the things I want to show you before we get into the meat of this is this. This is called a gravity-fed gasoline pump. This is from a bygone era because people back in the day, they didn't do like we do. They didn't go in and stick a credit card in there and fill up their car. They didn't go in and hand 20 bucks to somebody. Everything was a full service garage. You got your oil change, you got your windows washed, you whatever. And while the attendant came here, he also provided this. People purchased gasoline by gallons back then. They would go in and say, give me four gallons. So this gravity fed pump, which would be fed, would illuminate up here in the cylinder so that five, six, seven gallons would be issued. Remember what I told you earlier, gas rationing was in effect. This was a wonderful way for people to be insured they had the proper amount that they purchased. An item that's very interesting is talking to you about the following. The reason why I wanted to highlight the Coca-Cola is to tell you a story most people don't know. Robert Woodruff was the CEO of Coca-Cola. In December 7, 1941, immediately after, he sent a cable. He sent a cable to the President of the United States, and it said, I want to make sure that every American serviceman and woman can have a bottle of Coca-Cola for a nickel anywhere, no matter what the cost to our company is. President Roosevelt heard him, listened to his idea, and agreed to establish bottling plants in the South Pacific and Asia. As a result of that, Coca-Cola was able to be sent to our American troops over three million in one week. Now, let's go into the pride in the last part of this exhibit, and that is a general store. This store is not unlike those throughout the United States in small town America. Yeah, it really is a real place, and I'll tell you about that perhaps in the future. But I want you to come on in and take a look. You remember how we talked about rationing, and we talked about uh, people, the reason behind it was that so there'd be enough for everybody, no matter how much money you had. One of the things that's a perfect example of what I was telling you is that these are the coupons, the actual stamps that are blue and red. This, for example, is just applesauce. It sold for 13 cents, but it required 14 points. So what you would have to do was take off the points in front of the merchant and then hand him those stamps as well. These are indicative of items that were from that time period because the companies were contacted and provided us examples of this. One of the things right here, which is very unique because this is real, and this is a United States post office inside of a rural grocery store. Very rare that people from rural America had their own postal service. So merchants themselves acted as the postmaster, post general. Stamps, people could pick up their mail, send mail, etc. A novelty, which is here too, is also that telegrams could be sent as well via this telephone. Most times people forget we all have cell phones, we all have landlines, but back in the day a lot of people didn't have, and a community telephone was still in effect. All right? Prices certain up here. Prices are very interesting because I want you to look at this, for example, 46 cents a dozen for eggs. That is not that far off from 80 years later. The reason, because prices fluctuated in World War II during the availability. Pork, chicken, same. One of the things, Donald, I want you to post up is, I want you to go right up there. That is called a Blue Star Banner, all right? And what that is, that's indicative that someone was serving in the military from this uh, family that owned this store. A Blue Star denoted service member. A Gold Star is when someone had lost their life in the service, all right? Well, 
I think we've done a great deal. I'd be happy to listen to anybody that may have something and uh, entertain a few questions. Thank you. So, hey, buddy, we actually do have a few questions here for you. And um, one comes from Mark. He says, the exhibit looks so realistic. What inspiration did you draw from for the storefront? And is it based on real life locations? Well, as a matter of fact, if Donna will pan up to the top of the sign, it says Sandy Ridge Grocery. There really is a Sandy Ridge. It's located in rural Alabama, and it's a suburb of Fort Deposit. Mr. Eldon, the proprietor, was real. He was real before the war, during the war, and after the war. And I was fortunate as a young tyke in the 1950s to go in that store along with my brother on many occasions. Another question here from Donald, and he says, what is your favorite artifact here in Homefront USA, and why? Wow, that's very, un uh, that's really interesting. What's my favorite artifact? I think the favorite artifact that I would have, probably more than likely, would be a very small one, a very small one indeed, and that is part of the kitchen. Part of the kitchen, because those implements that were used in the kitchen were so very important. And I just think it's important that uh, the small and the large are both. Certainly Harley Davidson's are very cool and gas pumps are very rare, but do yourself a favor. Do yourself your own research and find these small things yourself and hold them for yourself. Hey, Martha asks, during this time of quarantine and rationing due to COVID-19, what is the one survival tip or lesson that viewers can learn from life on the home front during World War II? Wow, that's very interesting. I, I think it's real simple. I think we learned a great deal with COVID-19, and I think as most people out there will, will agree with, it has developed a family unity. It's allowing people to talk again. It's allowing social distancing. I have seen people sitting in their front yards just conversing with social distancing. That was the same thing in World War II. And the reason, because the family unit as a whole had to stay together, calm and collected, because their service member was serving in a military unit somewhere in the South Pacific or Europe. So Harry asks, can you talk a little bit about the banner that is located in the pawn shop hanging on the door? Uh, a tricolor pennant of these sorts were, were done in several different ways. Uh, mostly, these were souvenirs, and the souvenirs, depending on where the person was stationed, the base exchange, or whatever. A lot of these, along with, and you've seen these, a lot of these were sent to their mothers, w which are known as service pillows, that said, hey, I've finished basic training, I'm now stationed at here, I'm on this aircraft carrier, etc. Because they're souvenirs. Mike asks, did I miss the shoe, stop, shoe shine station? stand and the enlisted pilot outside the theater. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, first of all, you didn't miss it. The miss it, the, the shoe shine stand uh, that you used to see a long time ago, we removed it because everybody loves to touch the shoe shine boy in the stand. As a result, he kept getting broken fingers. So we put it back into the exhibit. The enlisted pilot, and great observation by the way, the enlisted pilot was the person at the ticket theater. As we all know, most people think that naval aviators are simply all 100% officers. During World War II, due to the shortage of available candidates, they allowed listed people to become naval aviators, and they stayed that way for many years. Great question. Sam asks, how old is the post office? Uh, that post office itself was from 19, around 1933. Uh, it was found in Marietta, Georgia, through a dear friend of mine located it when the foundation was able to purchase it. And, and let, me, let me talk about that for a second. The Naval Aviation Museum Foundation, I work for the Department of Navy, which runs this museum. The Naval Aviation Museum Foundation allowed the funding necessary for us to build this entire structure. And without that partner throughout these last 50 years, none of what you see here would have ever come into existence at all. We're very grateful. What were the kids required to do to help with the war effort? Well, that's very interesting. Requirements, none. What they did do, which is all part of the community involvement, 
is their parents, their grandparents. They got them involved. One of the leading candidates in, in, in groups that took charge of the scrap drives was the American Boy Scouts themselves. Now, funny thing about a scrap drive. Now, there's good and bad with the scrap drive. Good, they collected materials that really helped the war effort. Bad, we lost some very historical items because uh, the entire depletion of Civil War cannons and cannonballs went away because of those scrap drives. So Nathaniel asks, is the fridge the same brand as the Killer Cooler? No, as a matter of fact, this is a General Electric and the Killer Kelvinator, which hopefully my curator will talk about one day, is a, a different brand and model. Oh, both ultra rare. Raphael asks, hey buddy, what is the rarest artifact from this exhibit? The rarest artifact would probably have to be the Harley Davidson. That is truly a, a very, very expensive item. That's on loan to us. It's the longest loan and very unusual museums don't take loans. And we did on this occasion because of the rarity. Uh, if someone simply Googled the price of a World War II fully restored operational Harley Davidson, you would see the value of it. But value lies in the eyes of a beholder. Monetary value versus intrinsic value are, are much different, okay? And also, one other question. Sure. When service members came home on leave, did families have to use family ration coupons for the service member needs? Or did the service member have his or her own ration allowance that was transferable to be used at home? Very interesting. Great question, by the way. And it's real simple. It's a combination of both. And the reason being because when the service member was still in uniform, he had his own available chids and rations. Once he checked out and was uh, sent back home, his family simply reassumed that. Now, as we all know, rationing, we all believe, ended in 1945 with the end of hostilities. Rationing continued in certain things until 1947, sugar being that, that one item. Great. And thank you again so much for Absolutely. joining us. This is wonderful. Um, would you like to, to add anything else about this exhibit uh, from the person that helped design it? Well, it's more about this institution than, than a simple you know, exhibit. What I want is when we reopen, everybody come back. This is your institution just like it is ours. So I'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us for this edition of History Up Close, live at the Naval Aviation Museum. So next week, we will be profiling the A6E intruder with Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Skyle, retired USMC. Next, or this Thursday, April 23rd, 11 a.m. Central Time. Join us back here and everyone have a great day.